How's the stuff in here, mate? Okay. Um, well, thank you so much to Square Books, uh, Caitlin and Len, uh, for having me and setting all this up. And so thank you for this for um, at least from the beginning, for about five minutes. So I won't be able to uh, start over a lot more. I've always had the same predicament. When I'm home in Kentucky, all I want is to leave. And when I'm away, I'm homesick for a place that never was. This is what I told Alma the night we met. A grad student had thrown a party and we'd both gone. I don't know how long we've been talking or how the conversation started, but I've seen her watching me. That's why I went over. She was watching me like I might try to steal something from her. What does that mean, a place that never was, she said. All around us, people were talking in groups of twos and threes. It was a house way out in the country, decorated in the way you'd expect of a grad student, someone with an overdeveloped sense of irony and curation who also happened to be broke. Foreign film posters, a lamp made from antlers with a buckskin shade, those chili pepper Christmas lights. We were standing in the pink glow of a Wurlitzer jukebox. In her right hand, she held a solo cup and an unlit cigarette. Her long denim skirt was of the kind I associated with Pentecostals. On the other side of the Wurlitzer stood a life-size cardboard cutout of Walt Whitman, the one where he's got his hat cocked and his fist on his hip. I kept catching sight of him in my periphery and thinking it was another person standing there, eavesdropping. I don't know what I'm talking about, I said. I'm a little drunk. I can tell, she said. She took a sip of her drink and slipped her bra strap back under her shoulder. She looked around for a moment, sort of bobbing her head to the music, which was not coming from the jukebox, but from some other mysterious source. People were, were dancing in an attention-seeking way. She let her eyes pass over them briefly, and she turned back to me and shook her hair. It was all tangled and cut short in a kind of bob, the sort of dark hair that seemed red in a certain light, the light from the world, sir, for instance. I hail from Virginia myself, she said, putting on a phony accent. Do you ever feel a sense of suffocation when you think about it? Like, you start to hyperventilate and sweat, and the next thing you know, you're completely overcome with this fear that if you go home, you'll be trapped there and never be able to leave? The question seemed to amuse her. No, she said. Yeah, me neither, I said. She laughed at this. I grew up in DC, basically, she said. So not the real Virginia. This is my first time in Kentucky. Just visiting? Something like that. It's not what I expected. Did you expect us all to play banjos and tie our pants with rope? She laughed again. No, she said. I just thought it'd be, I don't know. She gnawed on her lip and looked up at the ceiling, searching for the right word. Trashier? That isn't the way I put it. If you go to the right places, you'll find that. Where I grew up was like that. And where is that? I grew up in Melbourne, I said, but it's not much more than a stop sign at a post office. And it's under-resourced? A flicker of memory. Every Halloween of my childhood, a round bale of hay was soaked in kerosene, lit on fire, and rolled downhill on Melbourne's main thoroughfare. People lined the street to watch as the bale jounced and tumbled, embers floating upward, bits of smoldering straw scattered in the road. I thought about this spectacle and how no one ever explained to me why it was done or for what purpose beyond entertainment and half-baked tradition. I remember my dad's heavy hand on my shoulders and the heat from the flames on my cheeks. And you could see the glimmer reflected in everyone's eyes. And so, yes, in a town without a movie theater or a mall where burning a bale of hay counted as entertainment, I thought it was fair to say that Melbourne was under-resourced. I say I'm from Paducah, I told her. It's the closest major town, if you can call it that. They sell these t-shirts that say Paducah, Kentucky halfway between possum trot and monkey's eyebrow. Then there's a cartoon picture of a monkey and possum hanging, hanging by their tails from separate trees, reaching out to each other, Sistine Chapel style. Wait, how is it between a monkey and a possum? Geographically, I said, those are the names of towns, possum trot and monkey's eyebrow. No, yes, that's amazing. I can think of another word. Well, she said, you're not there anymore. She raised her beard at me. I didn't have a drink at the moment, so I fist bumped solo cup. She was closer to me than she needed to be, I thought. Close enough that I could see the faint hairs on her upper lip and feel the heat from her body and her breath. I couldn't place what it was about her that attracted me. Maybe some sense of shared understanding, real or imagined, that we were of a kind. Maybe it didn't matter. I figured these sorts of things suffered from close scrutiny anyhow. She was a pretty girl at a party who seemed to enjoy talking with me, with whom I wanted to be close. Better to leave it at that. I'd probably feel differently about Virginia if I was born there, she said. Where were you born? She eyed me slyly for a moment, as if trying to discern whether I really cared. A country that no longer exists, she said. Is this a riddle? 
Her brows drew together almost imperceptibly. No, it's not a riddle, she said. She took a drink. There were teeth impressions in the lip of the solo cup where she'd been chewing on it. What happened to the country? I hope you find the right place, she said, not seeming to have heard my question. Maybe you'll know it when you see it and you'll feel at home. Then she touched my arm and said, I'm going to the porch to smoke. It was nice meeting you. I gave her my name and she gave me hers. Alma, she said. Shaking her hand was like putting a letter in a mailbox, not knowing if you'd ever get a reply. You dropped the envelope and shut the metal hatch and then you were empty handed. Before she walked away, she asked me what I did, if I was a graduate student or TA or what. I told her I was a writer, but maybe my speech was slurred. She looked at me like I'd meant to say I was something else. Thanks for the opportunity to be here, Rare Books. It's great to be back out. And one of the great things about being an English professor in Oxford, Mississippi, is that you get to meet the real writers when they come to you. They're not just people that you hear about or see about on the internet. They actually come and you get to talk to them. So I'm really grateful for this. Okay, then. Yes. Speak up a little bit. Okay. <laughs> And then you know everybody in the town. Too. That's right. <laughs> so if you're not talking about that. Somebody from the audience will say, "Speak up!" <laughs> <laughs> Here, do you need a? <laughs> How's that? That's great. Wow, there we go. Do you need a summary of what I just said? It's good to be an English professor in Oxford, Mississippi. Lee is going to speak. He can speak up too. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. So basically, you live here now, too. <laughs> um, so I want to go back to the beginning of, the, of what you just read, because I had also marked the very beginning. And I'm going to read just a little tiny bit of it. The very beginning. I've always had the same predicament. When I'm home in Kentucky, all I want is to leave. When I'm away, I'm homesick for a place that never was. That is what I told Alma the night we met. So I would say you set up everything about this book in those first lines. Mm -hmm. There's the tension between Owen and uh, between Owen and Kentucky and Owen and Alma. And that's really the book. I mean, those two tensions kind of play back and forth across each other. Um, and it's fascinating to watch the way they intertwine and work themselves out or don't really work themselves out over the course of the novel. So I want to ask you kind of two sets of questions. Sure. One, one set of questions about place and Kentucky and the setting of the novel, and another set of questions about um, kind of how a, how a writer writing a book about a writer writes a book. Okay. Yeah. That's a rough. That's a rough outline of the plan. Okay. So you, I don't know if you know this or not. Maybe you don't Google yourself. Maybe you're not that kind of guy. But if you Google him, there are four things that you can learn about Lee Cole. You can learn that he graduated from the Iowa Writers Workshop in 2019. You can learn that this is his debut novel and celebrated already. You can learn that he lives in New York City now, and you can learn that he is from someplace called rural Kentucky. <laughs> These are the four things. So I hope you, if you want people to know something else, you need to get it out there. Because yeah. this is the this is the image of you that emerges. So since I've learned that you're from rural Kentucky, I learned to hit both of those R's after I moved here to Mississippi. And nobody could understand what I meant when I said rural. You're from rural Kentucky. <laughs> then it turns out you and I are from the same place. Oh, really? We want to know more here in Oxford, Mississippi than rural Kentucky. So where are you from? Yeah, well, I grew up uh, in the Franklin County, close to the Graves County line, okay. uh, close to Melbourne. Uh, so, um, you know, my mom's side of the family was all from Graves County, and uh, my mom was born in Mayfield, which some people might know from the news recently. She was destroyed by a tornado. So, is that want you to speak more to the microphone? Okay. Thank okay. you. Um, I was just saying that my mom's side of the family is all from Graves County. Uh, and uh, she was born in Mayfield. And some people might have heard of Mayfield recently. It's been in the news because a terrible tornado basically destroyed the whole town. Um, so yeah, we grew up, or I grew up really close to the Graves County line. Do you want to know where I'm from? Yes. <laughs> so I'm from Harrison County. 
okay. um, which is, I grew up in rural Kentucky, not mm -hmm. close to a town called Cynthiana, but not in it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why from the moment that I started reading your book, mm -hmm. I thought I want to read more because, yeah. so I wanted to ask you about some of the things that, uh, some of the things that the characters in Kentucky do in mm -hmm. the novel. I mean, um, it feels to me like Owen, for example, often thinks that real life is happening somewhere else, yeah. that, the, that more important things are happening somewhere else. Um, it seems to me that he often feels like other people think that they are better than he is, whether they say that to him or not. Mm -hmm. He kind of has that sort of feeling. Um, he kind of, he tries to lose his accent, right? And does that with some success. Mm -hmm. So I can identify with all of those things. Yeah. Are those things, are those things true about you? They are true about me. Um, you know, as you can hear, I've lost my accent. Um, but like, as you can hear, I have not. <laughs> I go, I did try. <laughs> you know, like Owen in the book, I can remember having the experience of uh, a teacher. I remember pronouncing Washington like Washington, you know, and having a teacher at one point say, where's the R, R in that word, you know, and it being this humiliating experience for me. Um, but I don't know what it was exactly that, um, you know, if it was, I'm sure TV had a big, played a big part in him going off to school and, uh, you know, but um, I do think that Owen has this longing for the unfamiliar. Uh, it's sort of interestingly mirrored in Alma a little bit. Um, and, you know, that's definitely something I can identify with. I think my idea, I mean, I, I definitely wanted to get out and see the world and when I was a teenager and, and felt uh, you know, trapped a little bit in Kentucky, but my ideas about the outside world were completely delusional. You know, I was, I was imagining like, um, Greenwich Village and the Kennedy administration, you know, yeah, Bob Dylan, like showing up with a guitar, like Bob Dylan or something. Um, and of course, that's not what it's like. Anymore, you know? So, um, yeah, for me, there's always been that longing, longing for the unfamiliar. But then once I get out, um, I was noticing even just driving in today, um, how relaxed I felt driving the rental car um, compared to New York, where Every time I drive, it's like a, I'm on the verge of a nervous breakdown. You know, like so, there's so much going on. There's so much traffic, and um, yeah, my my unscientific theory is that you know your my nervous system is was somehow conditioned by growing up in Kentucky to expect a certain pace and a certain rhythm, and uh, being in New York can be overwhelming, you know, at times. So yeah, it was like when I go home or when I even when I return to the South, there's this sense of like being able to exhale. Well, I wanted to tell you that I thought you did a great job of capturing that sort of feeling mm -hmm. from one Kentucky into another. It was okay. has, has gone out and uh, tried to see the world and tried to, to lose her accent. Mm -hmm. They often think that the real world is happening somewhere where she is. Mm -hmm. And, and I will tell you that the other day when I was talking to my brother on the telephone and he was telling me that his washing machine was broken, <laughs> I was on the verge of saying, there's no R in that word. <laughs> and then I remembered the experience of the character in your book and yeah. I thought, that unnecessary. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I said, well, I hope you get it fixed. <laughs> now, Louisville is also an important place Definitely. in the novel though. Um, it's sort of pre Brianna Taylor Louisville, but it is um, a Louisville that's very different from, um, from different from Owen's place. And he feels that it gives him a taste, I think, yeah. of the world that he's speaking. Uh, lots of familiar landmarks there. My grandparents are buried in Cave Hill Cemetery, for yeah. example. So yeah. I saw lots of familiar places there. Yeah. But can you talk a little bit about the function of, of Louisville? In the novel, if the if, if rural Kentucky is sort of his place, what's he doing? Yeah, well, Louisville's interesting because I think um, a lot of kids from rural places who might find those places hostile to their, you know, political beliefs or you know might not feel comfortable, sort of flock to Louisville, as I'm sure it's true of any any mostly rural state where there's one you know large or medium sized city. Um, so, you know, I love Louisville and I'm excited to go tomorrow. I feel like it's 
it's haunted by so many ghosts for me. It's like overwhelming nostalgia when I go back because there are all these, these places that I can see like the ghosts of my younger self making stupid mistakes and you know, falling in love. And, you know, um, yeah, so it's, it was really important to me because you're right that it was like this, getting this taste of, of uh, the outside world without leaving Kentucky, you know? And when I, when I did, you know, return to Louisville, um, you know, when I was about 25, I worked at, at uh, the UPS Air Hub in, in Louisville at the airport and I was unloading freight. I did that for about two and a half years and they paid tuition for me to take some writing courses. At the Air Hub. And so that's sort of how I met um, some teachers there who had gone to Iowa and, and suggested that I, I apply. Um, and that was a really important time for me. I mean, I think, I, I had, didn't think I was going to get into Iowa and I was pretty sure I felt like I, I could be happy in Louisville and that's just sort of where I would be. Um, and it, it felt, um, you know, it felt like it was enough, like that was giving me the taste of the unfamiliar and the exotic. Well, it's, I think it's, uh, again, really, really well done. It's a place that I can recognize and a feeling that I can recognize. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about the writer in the book, because Owen wants to be a writer, and you were a writer writing about a writer, and you're a writer. So um, is, is there, where, where does where does Owen begin and you end, or where, how are the two of you connected to it? Well, I think that Owen, um, you know, the book, is fictional, but it does have its basis in my own experiences of trimming trees and, um, you know, wanting to be a writer and, and you know, so there are those similarities, but I, I do think that Owen is, a, is different in, in, in important ways. Um, I think he has more bitterness than I do. Um, and, you know, I, I like going back to Kentucky. I mean, I do, I think it's, it's harder during the uh, Trump years, um, because a lot of the, a lot of the undercurrents and tensions that had been present before suddenly became very intense um, uh, with family members, and you know, so that was uncomfortable. But you know, I, I'm not as averse to the idea of living there again, or uh, you know, going back to think Owen, Owen is. Um, but you know, um, I think. Writing about a writer is really tricky. I mean, one of my influences for the book is this um, documentary called Sherman's March. I don't know if you've yeah, seen that. Um, Ross McElroy, I guess is the guy's name. Uh, which I, I just love this documentary. It, it's sort of a, ostensibly about Sherman's March to the Sea, the lingering effects of Sherman's March to the Sea in the South, but it ends up being this bizarre personal essay about his failed romantic relationships. And there are a lot of them. Yeah. He failed over. And he's sort of interviewing all these former girlfriends and current girlfriends and asking them what went wrong. And, and they're all telling him like, what went wrong is that you can't stop recording, you know? So it's like his compulsion to, to record his life and to figure out what, figure out his relationships through that is, is ironically what also is torpedoing his relationships with these people. So that dynamic was interesting to me. This, the idea of this character, Owen, who has this compulsion to record his life. He's, he's keeping these meticulous notes and, and cataloging you know, all the objects and antiques in his grandfather's basement. Um, and then he starts writing about Alma. You know, and, and I liked that tension, the idea of, of that compulsion being his undoing. I have a lot of questions about the ending, which I cannot ask. <laughs> Because you want people will want to read it and have those questions for themselves. But he, I mean, he, I found him to be a very real character in that sometimes I was really rooting for him, mm -hmm. and other times I thought, yeah. I mean, don't be like that. Like, yeah, that's good. I mean, I don't want him to be thought of as the hero of the book or anything else. He's just a flawed character at the beginning, just trying to figure his life out. You know. So, I mean, that leads you to a question that, that, uh, that I don't want to be reductive, but it feels to me like this is a novel that is either about nothing, because it's just about a person, just a person's life, or it's a novel that's about everything. 
because it's a person's life. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's a sense in which the, um, I don't want to say that the romance of the love story is incidental, but it's kind of, you know, the story is about the growth of not just Ellen and Alma, but all, a lot of the ancillary characters too. They change over the course of the book. Yeah. So, you know, I see it as a, as a book, I guess mainly it's about Owen's growth, but it's about all the characters sort of growing and, and becoming new people by the end. So, but I mean, I felt like the, having it be a love story just felt like a great vehicle for that um, because it forces Ellen to confront all of these issues with family and class and politics that um, maybe he hasn't had to fully confront before. Well, that, and that is a, another tricky part of the novel, right? That it's set in a, a politically contentious time that, um, I don't know, suddenly now seems a little bit like a long time ago. It was pre-COVID, it was pre, we have a war, um, but really wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Um, so that was a, can, can you talk about how you set, set out to, did you set out to make some of those characters sympathetic to people like Owen who might be tempted to um, maybe dismiss them too easily, like Court or mm -hmm. his grandfather. Yeah. Even his own mom and stepfather. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that um, the 2016 election brought up all of these, all of these issues for me, I know, about empathy and what are the limits of empathy um, and how much of an effort is one sort of required to make, you know? Um, and I think that question has been really you know, important for people in the past years, especially with like the QAnon stuff and family members who are sort of falling into the rabbit hole of these really bizarre uh, conspiracy theories. And, and those are not fringe anymore. They're, they're sort of shockingly mainstream on the right. Um, so a lot of people are having to navigate that and figure out like, how do I, I mean, I, you know, I love my family and, and Owen I think loves his family too. Um, but there's always this question of like, you know, how do I love them and at the same time disagree strongly with them, you know, and that that became so, you know, front and center during the Trump years because the way I see it, it's like they aren't even political questions anymore. You know, it's not, you know, coming up with a like a Muslim registry or something isn't a, a political issue, it's a moral issue. You know, or, the January 6th insurrection is not, it's not something you can agree to disagree about. You know, it's, it's a moral, it's about right and wrong, you know? So yeah, it made, you know, sort of the friendly disagreements, you know, in politics, you say, oh, you know, whatever, like, we'll, we'll disagree about tax policy or something. It's like, it's not on the same, same level, you know? Yeah, and then how do you go on being in a relationship right. with a person when you feel like, it, it, you, things may have moved beyond the pale of what's morally acceptable. Right. Yeah. So I'm gonna ask one more question and we'll see if we have some questions from the audience. The novel's called Groundskeeper. So, and you were, you did some of this work, right? I did. This is another tidbit that is available on the <laughs> internet. Um, so why, what role does the groundskeeping play in the novel? Well, I don't know. It's, it's for one thing, I, it's just a weird job um, that at the time when I was trimming trees, I mean, it's, um, it attracts a, a kind of interesting sort of person. It's usually seasonal work because um, it's harder to do in the winter. Um, and the guys that I worked with, you have to be a little bit crazy to climb a tree with a chainsaw, you know, um, because it's so dangerous. And uh, so, yeah, it attracts a certain interesting kind of character. Um, and I tried to capture that with someone like Rando, for instance, who is uh, a character that, that was probably the easiest character for me to write, actually, because I felt like I had worked with the guys, worked with guys like that so many, so many times, you know. Um, but as far as how it's it's functioning in the book, I mean, I just think it's the idea of somebody working menial labor on a college campus 
and also taking classes there is very there's a lot of tension built into that you know uh, to to be in class one day and then to see your classmates as you're you know mulching a tree or something you know, next time. so um it felt like that was really rich with with tension yeah that really is do you have some questions audience <laughs> We're fellow Kentuckians too. I've already had a chance to speak to you. I'm from Louisville. Yeah, okay. But anyway, uh, having not read the book yet, because I just got it, I think what is particularly striking to me is that you um, are attempting to address how you can have a relationship with people that you don't agree with. And I think that's so significant right now because it's almost as if people are labeled to, from the get-go. If you say you're a liberal or conservative or whatever, people, some people won't even talk to you. Yeah. It's like you all, all just get this wall put up and they don't see you as an individual. Yeah. And I think that is, is really significant about this book. And I hope that it's the beginning of more people trying to investigate that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I think that's... I think that's really important to me. I mean, I, you know, Walt Whitman looms over this book uh, in more than one way, a literal like a cardboard cut out in the open scene. But um, yeah, I mean, I wanted these characters to be complex. I wanted them to contain multitudes and to not be reducible to a label. And that was one of the things that was so dissatisfying to me about all the kind of think pieces ar around the 2016 election. Um, it was like everybody wanted to, you know, we had Trump was president and everybody was trying to figure out why and they wanted to reduce it down to like one kind of crude, simple reason or something, you know, and, um, or to, you know, come up with some, you know, reduced down explanation for like a Trump voters psychology or something. Uh, and I don't know, I just found that so dissatisfying and, and I wanted to write about real people who were complicated. You said something very early on about uh, your two principal characters, uh, about something about knowing knowing them uh, quite well or, or knowing them thoroughly, basically. And, um, and I'm wondering, just as part of your creative process, um, did you know them when you began writing the book or during the course of writing the book? Uh, to what extent the things that did it change or grow or develop or how does that work? Yeah, I mean, well, for me, um, writing anything is a process of getting to know the getting to know the characters and um, then having to go back and sort of hide your brush strokes uh, when you, you know, early, the early drafts when you were sort of clumsily figuring them out. You, you have to go back and kind of cover your tracks um, and make it look like you knew them well all along. <laughs> Um, so, you know, because I share, you know, some life experiences with Owen, that was probably a little easier. Um, but with Alma, I had to do quite a bit of research and, uh, especially the scenes in the second half of the book where he goes to meet her family. Um, I, I spent, you know, several weeks, a couple months doing, doing research on that. Um, and, you know, it just sort of varied by character. You know, I, I mentioned Rando, that was a very easy character for me to write because I felt like I knew him so well. Uh, you know, it, it just sort of depends on what are, what are the demands of, of uh, the situation of the scene that I'm writing, how deeply do I need to go into a character's backstory. Um, but, you know, I wanted, um, it was important for, for me that even the secondary characters have some trajectory, that even they have some growth over the course of the book. And I think that growth is, is mirrored in the writer's sort of um, getting to know them, deepening, the, the writer deepening his or her understanding of them. Did they ever surprise you? Definitely. I mean, you know, I think a way to explain it. I mean, if you're writing a scene and you have a character and you're just trying to get to the end of the scene, 
um, and you are writing dialogue and you have a character say something and sort of, and you're writing it in kind of an offhand way, um, you may not think anything of it when you're writing it. But when you go back to revise, you notice that and you say, oh, this character said this here. Like, where was my mind when I wrote that? You know, where did that come from? And is there something there, you know, that I can unpack further, you know? So, yeah, I, I think of it as a process of, of discovery. And, and uh, if your characters, if you don't feel like your characters are surprising you, then you're probably, you know, not doing something right. I think. And there are considerable stretches of dialogue in the novel. They, they talk a lot to, without a narrative voice coming in telling you exactly what to think. So it was my advice. Yeah, I, I um, somebody asked me in an interview recently why I didn't use quotation marks. And I hadn't, I panicked because I hadn't really thought of a good answer to that question, <laughs> um, <laughs> except that the books I was reading at the time didn't have quotation marks. But um, what I came up with on the fly was that there were these long stretches of just back and forth dialogue between two characters. and. And you know, having quotation marks is almost unnecessary when there are these long scenes of just people talking. You know, getting to know each other. It's me again. <laughs> Considering the length of time it takes to not only write a book but to get it published, mm -hmm. did you actually start writing this book prior to the 2016 election, or have the idea about it, or are you that fast? Uh, no, I I had some notes and <clears throat> journal entries from when I was working as a pre trimmer um, and had tried to write a couple of short stories with char a character like Rando, for instance. Um, not about him, but he was sort of in the background being, being himself. Um, and you know, they, they weren't very good. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I sort of started writing this in um, 2019. Um, and what came to me first was the first line of the book. I, I was in this period of writer's block and um, there's this term that was sort of floated around a lot in Iowa called the emotional question. And I could never quite figure out what it meant, but I think, I think it's sort of like the internal conflict uh, or, and the way that the internal conflict of a character is sort of related to what the author is trying to figure out by writing the book. Um, and I sort of forced myself in a moment of desperation to distill down into a couple of sentences. What is the perennial problem in my own life? What keeps coming back to me? And what I came up with was the first line that when I'm home in Kentucky, I want to leave and when I'm away, I'm homesick. Um, and so everything after that was sort of inflected by that uh, insoluble problem. Okay, well, there's a time early on in Owen and Alma's relationship when th that relationship is described as like um, competing desires. When you meet someone new, between wanting to know everything about them at once and saving it all for later. And in the novel, that's compared to reading a good book that pulls you toward the end that you never want to reach. So I want to tell you that that was my experience of your book. So thank you for joining us. We're really glad to have you here in Austin, Mississippi. Thanks so much. With the next book.